Hello, Facebook friends and YouTube friends and the rest of the Artist Forge community at live. Welcome back to another Artist Forge Live. My name is Nicole York. I will be your host. And today with me, of course, your wonderful and talented and fabulous co-host, Becca Bjorki, Matt Stagliano, and Besson Saba. Hello, everybody. Hey, guys. How was your weekend? Oh, trying to remember now. <laughs> Officially, it was, uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, it was my birthday weekend, so what I remember was good. Happy and, birthday. Uh, Happy birthday. Happy, yeah. Thanks. So it was just like, I don't tell anybody, and I just kind of exist, but I did some night photography, drove a couple hours in the middle of the night, um, had some beverages, not at the same time, some, uh, some almost beverages. hit a moose, um, lots of stuff. Good weekend. I'm so glad to hear it. Well, happy birthday. I feel nice. kind of cheated now that I didn't know. <laughs> I couldn't say anything until just this moment. No advertisements. No. Um, how about you, Basam? How was your weekend? Oh, pretty average. Nothing really special. A little bit of work. Uh, hung around with uh, some extended family yesterday and just enjoyed the day and cooked and ate and cooked and ate and drank. And yeah. And today I've been working on uh, videos. <laughs> that sounds like a good weekend to me. If it involves like food and drink, I'm, I'm yeah. ha that makes my ho little hobbit heart happy. Becca, what about yes. you? Kind of, kind of the same. Actually, I'm very proud of my husband, Joshua. Um, he's like a unicorn of a man. Uh, he's perfect. But his one thing that he doesn't do is he doesn't cook. And ah. so, but but it was his dad's birthday, um, and uh, so we had his family over yesterday, and Josh cooked, and it was really good. I'm very proud of him, and now he's all excited and wants to cook more. So I'm just like, yes, yes. dang, nice. Yeah, you got to really encourage them when they do that. <laughs> oh, it was so good. You're great. You should learn more. It's amazing. Exactly. <laughs> I will just lounge on my Victorian couch. And right. Me. Just swoon every now and then and require yeah. some uh, <laughs> some sustenance. Make me friends. an unreal engine like your French girls. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, before you jump in, and I know you two nerds will love this, um, not Bassam. Um, <laughs> I, I watched the the new Lord of the Rings over the weekend, the thing the two episodes. And uh, didn't want to like it because, you know, wasn't, man, I'm all in. I'm yeah. all in on the world. And now I'm looking at things differently. I'm looking at all of these, like, landscapes and costumes and how they did that. I'm like, ah, that's CG. And then, like, all of these things, I'm like, I wonder if they made that mid-journey. Did they make it in mid-journey? <laughs> yeah. um, but... It was very cool. I'm all in. I can't wait to see where it goes. And I can't wait to hear what you guys say about it at the end of the series. I'm excited. Yeah. Anyway, sorry. Right now, visually, it's really beautiful. Like, the, I'm in for the visuals. I think, at least so far, the dialogue needs work. Like, they should have asked Pippa and Philippa, like, how they could kind of keep some of the, the feeling there. But um, there's a lot I like about it so far. Like, visually i'm i'm really excited i would sit there and just be like screenshot screen in my head screenshot <laughs> like just those moments where i'm like ooh, that's so so pretty well i'm just happy nerd. matt didn't call me a nerd yes <laughs> i just didn't think you were into that whole fantasy world so well i i'm not i really am not but now i'm curious not just because you said it i'm curious because of our group and everything we've been talking about and becca's work mainly becca's work i mean it's just like that, that so I'm, I, uh, I'm gonna do that. Yeah. We've already converted you into an art history nerd yeah. or blossoming art history <laughs> Just nerd. Pulling so you now, along a little yeah, bit at a time. Embryonic minuscule <laughs> art history <laughs> nerd. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> Yep, I was just gonna say, um, if for our friends who are joining us today in the audience, make sure you say hi so we know who, who is here and we can say hi back to you because hanging out with you guys is the best part of the day. So say hi and let us know you're here. Um, so just to kind of you know get us ready for what's coming, we have spent the last umpteen million get togethers talking about visual literacy and everything from, you know, um, 
things like the title of the image to composition in an image and subject matter and just everything that could potentially be included. And we're kind of bringing everything to a close today. And we're gonna try to use some of our visual literacy skills to break down several different types of images and see what we can come up with. So I'm really excited for that. Olga's with us. Hi, Olga. Hello. That's my sister. Um, yeah, so we're going to look at several different things today. And the whole goal is to take a lot of the skills that we've been working on, understanding a lot of these things we've been talking about, like, you know, composition and rhythm and the contrast of shape languages and color and texture and all of these things and see what we can get from these images and um, how they make us feel. But also, you know, can we guess the purpose of these things? What are they about? What are they trying to say? Can we guess any of the artist's intent by what's included in the image? Um, you know, we'll, we'll see how far we can get with that. So as we come toward the end of the visual literacy, um, I don't even know what to call it, sessions, breakdowns, I don't know what they are. But as we come to the end, I'm wondering, does anybody have any thoughts on, like, Maybe if we were to think about how we were beforehand after going through all of this discussion, have we seen an impact? Um, like Matt, I know you were mentioning even just seeing something like the new Rings of Power series, like breaking things down in your head, you know, and, and wondering how are they doing this and all that stuff. So like, do we have any anything at the end of this we feel like has changed stuff or real new realizations or epiphanies or anything? You know, I think for me, it helps me describe things better. Um, I'm more aware of all the components, right? And through playing with AI and playing with mid-journey, it's now helping me with my prompts. So instead of just saying, you know, um, model with a dress on, it's giving me like, all right, light from left to right, model with sequin dress, background this, depth of field this, right? So it's given me a, a better insight to how I would describe an image. And um, especially when I'm watching TV or movies now, I really am kind of breaking those things down pretty quickly and really studying how they're doing their color grading, how it's contributing to what's happening in the scene, right? All of these things, um, I can now see them as individual components rather than, oh, that's a pretty picture. You know, at least I understand it a little bit more now. And um, so I'm finding it eking into my world pretty much every day. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would say the, the same. I'm, I'm kind of getting consumed with that thing whenever I watch a movie. It's instead of, I mean, I'm watching the movie, obviously I follow the movie, but I'm just like Matt, I'm looking at all these individual elements and I kind of feel proud that I'm picking up on those things, right? Just just having gone through this. But one thing I did is I, I went back and I've been, you know, as, as we, you know, we, we exchange photos. So with the news here, I go back and look at my photos. I looked at my, a whole, my whole portfolio on my website and realized that from a composition perspective, one of the things that, I, that I've been paying a lot of attention to, not within my own work, but within everything I see is camera angles. And I'm starting to realize that it's the thing I use least in my photography. Right, especially in studio photography, uh, with boudoir photography because it's in different areas of the house, on beds, near walls, so on. Yes, I I tend to move around and I tend to look at different angles. But in the studio, it's almost always head on, straight on. So camera angle doesn't play much into my into my composition, although other visual literacy elements do or composition elements do. Uh, so one thing I I need to kind of it kind of doesn't even come to me. I just go about doing my, the same thing over and over. And I don't know if it's laziness, uh, but one thing I will, I do want to pay attention to is camera angles and, and, and vary a little bit more what I do, you know, more, more intentionally. Uh, you know, if I'm going to take 30 pictures, maybe five at different angles, as opposed five each at different angle, as opposed to 30 at the same angle, right? Which is what I usually do. Right. So that, that's kind of one specific thing that, that, I, you know, I'm looking to apply, but yeah, very happy to be just like aware of all of this and just like it's the richness that you can get out of, you know, looking at art and movies and pictures and yep. For sure. It's, it's great for one um, to know Matt, in your case, like having the language 
because language is so critical to the way that we think about things. And oftentimes we can enjoy things or appreciate things. And without having the language there, we can't really elucidate why or then recreate why, right? Because we, we can't always describe them to ourselves. So it's really fantastic that you feel like you're at a place now where that part is growing and you can notice them more. And then in your case, Basam, even just taking the time like thinking, okay, I should do this. And then taking the time to go back through your portfolio and look at that stuff and go, well, what have I been doing? And what about my visual language here? Could I address or improve or whatever? And like, that's, that's an incredible like yeah. gift to be able to give yourself as an artist. It was, it was interesting. I got a new camera uh, two weeks ago and I was out in the backyard playing with it. And I'm doing all those things, taking pictures of flowers and bees and shit. And I was just kind of like, where's the story? Where's the story? What's a better angle? How can I compose this better? And like all the components, like what's really in the frame? Of course, I'm missing all these amazing shots because I'm like, what's in the frame? And how can I? And but it was really interesting how um, how when I can calm the mind, I'm not doing client work. I really am looking for those things m more directly um and taking my time it slowed me down quite a bit which is nice yep so that's that. a big one love it becca what about you i mean no, no this is also one of your areas of interest but like has there been anything come out of like our discussions and our exercises you think yeah i got really excited about some of the historical context stuff um like the the prostitute painting that was just like how oh, cool, I didn't know that. Um, and it's just, you know, it's that always reminder. It's like, there's so much information out there to be absorbed and to expand your mind and what you know about, like that just gets me so excited. There was the, um, the, the Persian painting, the Persian Prince painting too, was also similar effect. It's like, I recognize, you know, general kind of area, but like once the definitive context was there, it was mind opening. And I just, I love that. And that reminder of like, okay, I need to go and keep learning forever because I'll never get it all, but I want as much as I possibly can. Um, and I was thinking a little bit too, like what Basam was saying about um, kind of, and Matt too, just like that, that interest that like it's ignites something in you. Right. And you start looking at it and looking for things. And I remember feeling that way, like really, really intensely when I first was kind of like really trying to learn about cinematography and like, eye tracing, like following the composition from shot to shot to shot to shot throughout a film was like that for me. And I, I just, I couldn't not look for it for like months. Like I couldn't even pay attention to what was going on. It was just like, oh, oh, there's a thing, there's a thing. And there's, there's the following of the shape and there's the direction of the light. And this is what they're telling me. And I want to be that excited all the time. And so getting these reminders to look for those things and to be reminded of those things and to push ourselves to do things like change the angle of our camera or, you know, our illustration or whatever. Like, it's just, I, I love talking about it. And I love hearing you guys talk about it and have that reminder for myself. Cause we fall into these areas of comfort, these things that we're comfortable doing and we know how to do. And it becomes almost, what is the word? Mechanical, instinctual. Mm. And how do we break the pattern to make more impactful art? So the more we can push ourselves, the more exciting it is, I think. Right. And, and that's the beauty of, of groups like we have here, you know, and on our friends is that like what I what I do, most of most of the average person that looks at it loves it and doesn't even know the difference. Right. And and we don't learn from that. And this, you know, this is the beauty of this is that by by being around other artists, by talking about it, it's just it, it, it instigates action. Let's put it that way, as opposed to, hey, everybody loves my work. I'm good. <laughs> I love that I word. Like that. In, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's like, ooh, it instigates action. I, like I guess because that. <laughs> that's my third language, so I'm trying to figure out words, grammar. Anyways, yeah, second language, sorry. Go ahead. No, I love it. I think that's fantastic. Um, yeah, I, I think for me, the biggest thing has just been hearing what other people see and challenging myself to step outside of my natural preconceived, you know, the things that I would immediately pick up on are because that's the way my reticular activating system works, right? Like that's the way I've trained my brain. So when other people see things I wouldn't have seen, it's just that reminder of like, oh, you are still like in your own patterns and in your own biases for what you pick out in an image. And when somebody else sees something different, it's that challenge of like, okay, there's probably more here, <clears throat> excuse me, there's probably more here than you see 
how can you look at this differently? How can you pick up new things from this? Like, how do you have to change the way that you think in order to appreciate or see or observe things that you didn't see before? And that definitely challenges me, even when I'm making my own art to go, okay, so like, how would Bassam have seen this? Or how would Matt have seen this? Like, you know, how can I step outside of my own box to be able to appreciate this stuff differently? And then that translate and in, translates into the art that I make. So even just, I think that part of this exercise has been really, really cool. Yeah, totally. I mean, we have to remember, right? If we're <clears throat> speaking to an audience, we need to be speaking their language. And if they're not picking up what we're putting down, then maybe we need to uh, follow like Bassam and learn that second language and change our syntax and pick different words, you know? Yeah, I mean, they say, they say if you can't explain something simply, you probably don't understand it as well as you think you do. Um, and I think that that's kind of like just a good like base level, you know, to remember, like if you can explain it simply, that means you probably understand it pretty well. And I think the longer we've spent with this visual literacy and all of these exercises, the easier it feels to, to be able to communicate what it is about an image that's making me think or feel or or whatever. So I'm, I'm excited about that. And I'm wondering for our friends in the audience, have you walked away with any kind of epiphanies or has anything changed for you guys since we've started the visual literacy exercises? Like, have you noticed yourself thinking differently or maybe making art differently or even just looking at pieces of art in a new way? I'm, I would love to know. So if you'd share that in the comment, I would love it. <laughs> Which is unfair. Some, not all of us find the art of explanation an easy thing to do. Um, so <laughs> I maybe should have qualified that statement. <laughs> it's easier to simplify things when you really understand the subject. There we go. That's, that's a better way to go about it. Thank you, Bassam. I appreciate that. Yeah, so share in the comments, everybody. Um, I would love to hear because, you know, we've spent a lot of time going through this and, and put in a lot of work to try to break these things down and understand them together. And if it has helped you, um, I would love to know that because it just justifies all of the things that we've been doing and also lets me know like what things stuck. So if we ever do something like this again, I know which things worked and which things didn't. So, um, so let us know. And we're going to go ahead and start looking at some images and breaking them down and using those skills. So remember, we've talked about kind of three pillars to visual literacy when it comes to art, visual literacy, just being the way that we interpret and understand the things that we see. And when it comes to art, we have kind of three pillars that we look at. And one is the context of the art. So where are we seeing it? What is it surrounded by? How does the environment that we encounter this art in help us interpret the art or affect our interpretation of the art? So if we see something in a museum, we might, well, it's not even a might, it's guaranteed that that is going to affect our interpretation in a way that is much different from if we saw it on a billboard or hanging on the wall in somebody's home or on a magazine in a gas station, right? So the context is important. If you were to see a piece of art hanging in a gallery with a lot of other artists who are very well known and expensive, then you're gonna look at that artist <clears throat> and that art as if it is a piece that belongs there. So this must be an important artist. This must be an important piece. This person probably thought a lot about it and had very serious artistic -y thoughts. Um, and, and it's going to influence the way that you think. Um, and then we have the internal language of the image. So what did the artist put into, well, it doesn't have to be an image. It can be a sculpture or other, you know, visual art. But what did the artist include here? How are they using these tools of visual literacy in order to communicate? Um, and things like subject matter and composition and symbolism and color and all of, all of the things we've talked about over the months and weeks, all of those things combined. And then we have the external language of the image. So what has the artist included that helps influence your interpretation? What's the title of the image? Are they sharing an artist's statement or history of the image or of the body of work? And all of those things then also go into the interpretation. So those are kind of the three pillars that we've looked at. And now we're gonna look at several different pieces of visual art and see <clears throat> how can we use what we know about the way that our brains work to find out maybe what the artist intended, how something made us feel and why, what 
pieces of language are being used that help communicate. And so if we understand that, if we can look at other people's art and break those things down, then hopefully that translates into the way we make art and we can ask ourselves those questions. How do I want to use composition here? How do I want to use color here? Um, and just make us more facile in general with the tools that we have to create art. And I don't mean the technical, I can keep uh, my arm still and make a nice curved line. I mean, the technical tools that we have in here. How do I make color and tonality and composition and subject matter work in such a way that it communicates the way I want it to? So that's what I mean by those tools. Um, it's all brain tools that <laughs> we've been building. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and we're gonna start looking at stuff. If you're hanging out in the audience and you have any thoughts on how this whole visual literacy exercise has affect you, we wanna know, share them in the comments. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. And we are going to start with this image and I'm not gonna tell you anything about it yet. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm still recovering from COVID so I have congestion. Um, I'll try to mute myself if I need to clear my throat but it's gonna happen so just bear with me. Um, so we're gonna look at this image and we're gonna just try to find out what's going on here. So what do you see when you look at this shot? feel free to share that in the comments. I will grab your comment um, and share it on the screen so that we can all discuss it together. But I'm just gonna begin with giving us a moment to have a look at this and then ask you, what do you see when you see this image? Solitude. Action. This is sad to me. Yeah. I see change. Mm -hmm. Immediately the first thing that came to mind was change. And that I want to clone out that little thing to the left. I know it's bothering me too. <laughs> this thing? Litter. Yeah. <laughs> if you're in the audience today looking at this image, what do you see? See, see, one thing I find interesting about this is it's, it's normal waves breaking on the, on the beach, yet it looks like a whirlpool. If you look on the right hand side, there's kind of a there's a whirlpool thing happening. Um, a vortex, yeah. And I, I just find that kind of interesting, even mm. though. I, do you see it? Do you see the the, the, the circle? Yeah, this 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 kind spiral? of spiral. Yeah, on the right hand side, especially. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the way that the the way that these are all yeah, connecting. Yeah, right there. Kind yeah, of. yeah, yeah. Um, Olga saying that she sees the horizon going through her head, shedding of clothes, going into the deep end, perhaps an ending or a new beginning. That's what I'm stuck on. I yeah. can't decide if it's an mm -hmm. ending or a beginning. Yeah. It's rebirth I, or death. That's where that color palette it feels, is fooling me. It feels like, yeah, it feels like both. Right? I think there's, there is, yeah, there's something about the ending that necessitates the next beginning. I mean, we see that even with death, you know, the, your ending then becomes the beginning and the sustenance for a new life. And the pulling off of the dress definitely feels like the shedding of something heavy. I mean, just look at the weight of the dress. It's just pulling downwards and puddling and like... I'm just in awe of the simplicity. Mm. Like, yeah, this reminds me. Uh, there's the last scene. If you saw the movie Big Night with Stanley Tucci, um, there's a point where woman at the end does this exact thing: sheds her clothes, runs into the ocean. It's a big kind of rebirth moment, and that was a very kind of sad to happy moment, sad to relief, and. That's kind of where I'm at with this is I don't know where it sits. Is it sad to relief? Is it excitement? Is it not? And not being able to see an expression leaves all these things up to the imagination, right? And yeah. that's why I love it. 
And it's also, I mean, like, given that we don't get that expression, she's she's uninterested in the audience, right? I mean, she's consumed and focused on whatever Focus. the next action is. Yeah, there's um, there's um, the ambiguity there where you don't know is she going into the water? Like, is she going to go walk in and not come out? Is she going to go cleanse herself? Is she, I mean, you, you don't know and there's no additional context. Ooh. I'm gonna switch over to my phone. Okay. Um, there's no additional context in the image that would lead you to believe either way. Um, Olga saying also looks like the shedding dress for more masculine clothing underneath. So that's kind of, oh, let me, let me jump in here. So it's hard to say because of the nature of underclothes during this time, could those be suspenders? Maybe, but more likely it stays. Um, and given the time period, probably short stays. would be my guess anyway. But it certainly could be. And just look at the color palette here. It's I want to show much... up the color. Yeah. yeah. And it's so it's... harmonious too. Yeah. It's very um, contemplative. Mm -hmm. Almost melancholy. What do you guys think? Sunrise or sunset? I think it's I think it's late afternoon. I don't think it's either. I think oh, yeah, well, not, not deep, not not right on the horizon light, but um, then late in the day I would go. No, it's hard to tell with color grading because um, you lose some of the inherent quality of the light color. But that you've would got be my your. Guess. You've got the rays in the background that make it seem to be middle of the day. Is that what you were just saying, Becca? I, I couldn't hear what you were saying previously, but um, there's some of those rays in the light cloud way in the horizon where the sun's poking through. And that, to me, would indicate later in the day rather than the angle of the sun at sunrise coming through the clouds that way. Make sense? Sure. That could be a streak on my screen. It could could totally be dirt. I have no, no idea. No, it is. It's right here. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so Olga saying the soft pastel tones with a stark contrast of the dress. So yeah, we're definitely seeing like, it's a harmonious color palette. We talked about on Friday, the visual weight that something can have and the darkness of this dress, like all the visual weight is so heavy right in the center here that just like centers the entire frame and sets her apart from everything else. I mean, she's obviously already separated from everything else, but like even like that that dark visual weight, the heaviness of that blue sets her apart even more because everything else is so soft. So we also have the contrast in shape language, right? And direction because everything is horizontal except her. She is the vertical piece of this image. And she just cuts across all of the horizontal language there. Is there anything else anybody sees that y'all want to share before we learn a little I, more about this image and then move on? I like how from the, the foamy area as the waves break, everything starts to come in and spread out. The sand spreads out, her dress spreads out. There's just such beautiful use of those lines. And it's this cascading, leading me to think more about things being shed, washing away, right? It's just this waterfall effect that it's giving me. And it's just, um, it's a really nice use of those lines where they curve, but you've got this ridiculously straight horizon. Um, I just really like that cascading effect of everything culminated in that dress. Yeah, I agree. What about our friends in the audience? Anything else y'all want to share? Anything you see about this image that you, you want to make sure everybody is able to notice? 
Um, and remember, so some of the things that we look at, um, some of those visual literacy skills, obviously, body language, um, there's a great gentleness in this body language. We don't have expression to go by here, but color, shape language, contrast, subject matter, costuming. Um, and, and if we were to look at that, this is obviously a well taken care of piece of clothing. It's not tattered, it's not falling apart, it's not dirty. It's also not particularly fancy, right? So there's a very good chance that this is maybe middle class, but not wealthy or upper middle class, but not wealthy. Um, she has her chemise and her stays and everything. And so she's wearing the kind of normal garb of the time. But is there anything else that her costuming might be saying that we can read? Or anything else anybody notices before we move on? I'm going to take that as a no. All right. So this is a still from the movie uh, Portrait, of a, Portrait of a Woman on Fire. It's a French film about uh, a painter in the 1800s who's commissioned to paint the portrait of a, a wealthy woman and they fall in love. Um, and so there's obviously like during that time period, something like this not being socially acceptable. There's obviously going to be a lot of ups and downs. It's a romance. So the, the difficulty, the kind of melancholy, all of those things I would imagine come into play. Let us continue. Let's see what's next. Okay, this a photo from Meg McDonald, something I grabbed from Unsplash just because I wanted to give us, oops, sorry, something that we might not usually look yeah. So when we see this using our visual literacy skills, what do you see? Shapes. So many shapes. Such shapes. This is weird. I like it. Is that a body? This is a, like the a people shape here? Yeah. Or here? Yeah, yeah. At the bottom of the stairs. Here? Uh-huh. I don't think that any detail has been included to make it a people specifically, but I can definitely see where, like I can definitely see where that could, you could read that in. I'm annoyed. And I'll really? Tell you I'm, I'll tell you why I'm annoyed. I'm annoyed that I'm winded just looking at this, knowing that those <laughs> stairs, it's not one flight, that there's a long way to go. The No, the thing that annoys me is, and it's just, it's my personal criticism, right? Is that bottom triangle underneath the stairs, make that white or, you know, the gradient that you have above. And now you've got this one really striking strip of stairs through the middle. I just keep going to that, like looking for something under the stairs just because of the color of it. Maybe if it had matched that Adobe color, um, then it would be different. But this, kind of desaturated brown grunginess um, of that little triangle in the bottom right, that's totally distracting me from the rest of the cool lines and all the stuff in this image. So this, that's interesting oh, so to me, Matt. Are you looking more at it as 2D image or are you looking more at it from a design perspective? Um, I don't know if I'm if I'm necessarily separating those two. Um, I I guess, you know, if this is just me critiquing what I don't like about it, right? What I see are is really cool use of all those circular lines, right? Um, I love the person above echoed in the banister. Like the 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 Lego shaped body, right? The stick figure body of the windows, <laughs> and yeah, and then the kind of echoed in the the shape of the banister. Um, I don't know how to answer that, Becca. I guess if I were looking at it from a design perspective, I'd also be freaked out by all the waves in the the stairs that are going up, not having a straight line in it. Um, 
but now we're wandering into my own neuroses. So it's not really a design thing. It's just how I like things. Um, I don't know. I don't know how I'd answer that. Yeah, well, it, I mean, I'll answer that question by saying, in, in my case, can you hear me? Sorry about all the, yep. the noise and all that. But in my case, I, I can only see it from a design perspective for some reason. I can't see it at anything but. I don't know why. To me, that's that's purely about design and, and shapes and modern house feature as opposed to some piece of art. Yeah. Don't know why. I have to apologize really quickly, Basam. I totally told you we were going to look at your images first before we did anything else, and I oh, completely no forgot deal. like a boob. So. No, no big deal. But I just realized that I can be sitting in the back seat while they drive, whoever I'm driving to the airport, my, my, my daughter. And... Well, that's true. So I'm, so I'm in the back seat. I completely forgot that I can do that. So there you go. Would rather be here, so, even if it's not my photos. By the way, it's not about my photos. <laughs> really I know, isn't. I know, but I mean, hearing for, hearing from you um, helps no, no, when fine. we're looking at them. So, um, so Becca, what was your? So you wanted to know how he was looking at that. Um, what's your thought process there? And while you're thinking of that, really quickly, just want to say. So Crystal saying, love the repeating pattern. Um, me too. I think the shape language is great in this. Or Olga saying, organic form and cleanliness merge. A dance between organic lines and sterile which I think is really great. Um, so what were you thinking there, Becca? Yeah, I mean, I, my like my first impression looking at it is I'm looking at it as architectural design. I'm not so interested in it as photograph. And so it's interesting to me that Matt kind of went that other direction, but he's right that they aren't necessarily differentiated. I mean, even from an interior design or architecture perspective, like those differentiations in color and where the light falls and everything, those are still considerations to take into into account. Um, but I just, I'm just curious, like what you, what do you guys see first? Do you see the photograph or do you see the building? And then Bassam mentioned he sees it as design. So the, the building, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's interesting to me too, that that is kind of the thing that Matt, um, that you notice as well, Matt, cause I don't notice it at all. Like that, hmm. that part of the frame underneath the stairs, I think it's so neutral. It just feels like, I don't know. I, it, it doesn't seem to me like it, an area of interest. I, it somehow helps weight the image. Yeah. My, my yeah, I just don't see it. And maybe that's because I am looking at it from an ar architectural standpoint. And so it doesn't stand out to me from like a visual design thing. Um, would I, like if I were painting something like this, would I include that? I don't know. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's really interesting to think about. I think part of it is I've been doing a lot of real estate photography lately and mm -hmm. I'm always looking for these things that catch my eye or don't look quite right or look unfinished. And that looks unfinished to me where everything else is really clean, beautiful. Um, so anyway, it just kind of stuck out to me as like, why does my eye keep going there? And it just, there's yeah. something about it that mm, makes me feel not right. So interesting. Cause I find this really peaceful. Mm. Like something about this is very like calming to me. And it could be, this falls into my natural love for interior. Like my, I am, give me plaster, give me imperfection, give me natural materials and organic shapes. It just makes my heart so happy. So when I see something like this, I'm like, yes, <laughs> this is my favorite if kind of thing. If we're voting, I'm with Matt, by the way, just in case you're wondering. <laughs> okay, right. if, we, if we vote, I will take note of that. <laughs> so I think like from a visual literacy perspective, there's obviously several things happening here that friends in the audience have already mentioned, but we've got, we have the repeating shapes, right? The curves that are here that are echoed in the wall that are all organic and just a little bit imperfect. And then we've cut that with the much more, the 90 degree angles and the much more um, angular shapes that are in the stairs, even though they still have curves, they've got corners, right? And so these kind of all of these soft curving lines then kind of cut right down here and really interesting from a compositional perspective, would you call this composition 
balanced, even though it's not symmetrical, would you call it balanced still? No, the asymmetry bothers me a little bit. Doesn't take away. I mean, I, I like the feel. I like the look. I just, it does bother me a bit that it's not balanced. And maybe if Matt's, if the little triangle was white, it would be more balanced. I'm going to disagree. I think it's, I think it's pretty You're bad. allowed. <laughs> I find it balanced as well. Yeah. I think the negative space here and then the echo of the shape here, there's something about this line that feels balanced to me. And I mean that the literal balance between the light and the dark, I think works very well. If that bottom area were lighter, I think it would be maybe more uncomfortable in the composition if all the darkness was concentrated just to the stairs. Let's, let's, let's give that a shot. Just real quick. Also, I apologize if you guys can hear the cat like me. <laughs> Let's see. I feel like I'm watching one of those Instagram, this is how you do it in Photoshop things, and I'm disagreeing. <laughs> And, <laughs> and I'm yelling at the screen. Don't no. Why would no? Don't do it that way. Isn't it interesting how different people use Photoshop? That's like that's, I don't think yeah, anyone uses it the same. Billion ways. That's way more uncomfortable to me. Yeah, I don't like it. Do you prefer that, Matt? Like once you see it a little more evened out, like does it feel yeah, I think Does it um, feel better from a like a visual perspective for you. And yeah, I, it it actually does. And you know the, I think maybe what's bothering me more. Yeah, like if those tones were blend, and we're not going to turn this into a Photoshop thing. But like no. if those tones, if those tones were blended and it was the same kind of like greenish white, um, and this strip of orange was going through the middle of it, I think. I would probably feel a little bit better. It's not going to change that I'm still looking at it like, oh, composition is just a hair off for me. But um, yeah, man, when it goes dark, nope, nope. Just sticks out too much. Interesting. More Kandinsky flashbacks. <laughs> okay, moving on. We're going to keep on going. Let's. Um, we're going to grab, I think, Bassam's stuff while we still have him. Whoops, I saved it. Don't save it. We'll we'll talk about those later. Dang it. I'm grabbing all the wrong things. Okay, so here we have an image that Bassam has shared. So when we look at this image, what do we see? Oh, really quickly, let me, let me grab um, Olga's thought. She said, I didn't even see the brown triangle at the bottom until Matt said something. It makes sense as to what you would see if you were standing in the room, so it doesn't bother me at all. It adds something to it. <laughs> moly, so moly, moly. Don't look at the mole. Don't look at the mole. <laughs> it's so interesting the way our brains work. Okay, so this shot, this lovely lady, what do we see here? The graphic nature of the curve in this is really big to me. I think because of the nature of the kind of hyper white background, um, it immediately becomes a little more graphic in terms of like shape. But it also yeah. soft. It's Ooh. so clean, so clean. The lines of everything are so clean. The shadow, the body, the hat, like everything is just so crystal clear. I love it. I'm not talking about the sharpness of the image. I just love how it stands right. off that white very, very so cleanly. This is how I imagine myself looking, hanging out in my yard. <laughs> <laughs> Your neighbors must be very happy. <laughs> There's more pajamas and messy hair. Um yeah, I'm just, I love I love the softness in all those those curves, the softness in the shoulder, you know, all these these rounded shapes in the hat. 
is it an earring or is it hair? I mean, it, it makes it feel sensual, even with that very, very hard light. Yeah, I mean, the, um, the yeah. way the light comes off that backdrop is obviously giving a lot of that kind of soft wrap around. I like the, um, whoops, I like the balance of the hat and, and the garments. Mm-hmm. Mm. And I think if her legs were brighter, it would, it would not work as well. Yeah. Like if we tried to match tonality here and here, I think it would, I think it would be less strong. Yeah, so, I, so, one thing on the balance. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, go ahead. I, I on balance, I feel like it's a little top heavy. Like if it were cropped tighter. Uh, top top heavy or bottom heavy? Or I no. guess yeah, yeah, that would be bottom heavy, bottom heavy. Um, like it, it needs oh, okay. a little maybe less negative space. Like let her her shape fill more of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, yeah. I tried cropping it like Nicole just did, and it just it, it just ended up kind of chopping her in half. I didn't see, uh, but I, that, I, I'm curious about your opinion about that bottom left being heavy, right? Well, heavy's not are, bad. So, are you thinking? But, oops, are you yeah. thinking, Becca? It needs more. Yes. Of that. <laughs> Ignore my hands here. So, so the reason I, I the reason I gave you this image is it's it's this is all about again camera angle and then that word I can't pronounce the Fibonacci um, spiral. If you actually if you actually flip yeah. it, it ends up right between her hands and her eyes, right in the middle there, right. And that curve will follow her back. I know, so that's I kind of I interesting. It wasn't. In I think I accidentally threw mine away. Yeah wasn't intended that way, but that's, that's, uh, I just find it interesting that it is that way. And again, camera angles, which I told you, I don't usually vary camera angles. Uh, I believe this is a good use of, of, of camera angles. This was actually the intention here. Don't laugh was to do a Lindsay Adler style image, by the way, that was the intent. No, I think that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I just, I really enjoy the, I like the composition. That's, that's why I wanted to get your opinion on it. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I would say that this is this is a, the type of image that I, I I mean, her work is bold and punchy, and there's lots of contrast and like. And I would say that you nailed that part of it. Um, Olga saying the shadow transition is perfect. I would love a tighter crop. The body and the hand doesn't help the composition. Um, her body language does match from top to bottom, and so she kind of falling in, in line with you there, Becca, and wishing that, that there was a little less white space. Yeah, even just oddly, like where the the comment box just showed up on the screen, like you could crop this so many different ways. You could go real mm. tight, like even even hit the edge of the hat and the back and right under the elbow, and mm -hmm. it still works. And I think that's something right. that's really awesome about well composed and, images. You can cut them fifty different ways, and they're still going to work. Right. Yeah. I also believe if the legs were wide open just a little more where you can see white space between the two legs, it could have helped. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely many, many different, many different ways, ways that you that could crop this and still have it work. And that's great for client work, too, because, you know, they're going to be putting it up on their profile picture or their stupid Instagram restriction size or whatever, like things to think about <laughs> like composing how many ways can this get cut up yeah well, this was personal work but yeah it would but of, of anyone of a subject also so i think take it. yeah right um, um <clears throat> excuse me i also think that it's great one of the things i like about this is that the contrast that you have here is contrast all the way through so contrast in tonality contrast in shape language but also the contrast of the the punchiness of the image versus the real softness of her her body position her facial expression all of that really soft and then everything else so contrasty um which makes a great juxtaposition i think all right continuing on we have more to see
something a little more abstract. It's gross. I'm into it. <laughs> so what do we see here? If you're in the audience today, what do you see? Yeah, this was this was Saturday night. <laughs> um, Is this what comes out of you after walking up those curvy stairs? Yeah, yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> Interesting. Interestingly, I, I've seen hundreds of images like this lately because my sister does is uh, is uh, been doing this type of art for about two years now, and uh, she has hundreds of pieces that she's worked on, and I'm, I'm, she's always sharing them with me. So this looks very fami familiar to me. What Very what kinds of art? Like, is it like uh, I don't know paint? what you call it, but it's where you you spin you spin paint it's on paint like uh, uh, it's like horizontal. You put it horizontal on a table and you you put paint on it and and you, and you spin it uh, and it or move it in certain directions so that you get some movement in the paint. Um, that's cool. all I know about it. Sorry, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think so. The, the stuff that pops out to me. So first, I love abstract art um, because there's um, and and so I should qualify abstract art like this, where there is a lot of room for the organic nature of material to express itself. Um, I there's something I really love about it that this reminds me in some ways of lichen growing on rocks. Um, and like there, there's like a lot of the organic nature of it that I really love. Um, but the visual things that make this so interesting to me is not even the color. It's the shape contrast. It's these long straight lines and then all of the bubbles and the circular and the rock, you know, the shape that's almost rock like of these things meeting but not touching. Um, I really, really like that. And I think my guess is that if I were to No, I don't want to use that. It always has stuff. I don't like the way that they have these things set up. Everything's very dark. Anyway, my guess is that if I were to play with this in black and white to bring the proper contrast back to it, that I would Hop like it. Your channels. Huh? Hop over to the channels. I just don't want to take the time. Oops, to do it. You know, and we're, when you're asking what we're seeing, for me, it's this this protoplasmic beginning of life feel to it, mm. right? Very cellular, clearly. Um, and that is somewhat calming to me, right? And I don't know why, but all these little puzzle pieces fit together so wonderfully naturally um, that it doesn't feel like paint thrown or splattered or anything like that. It just feels more like a photograph through a microscope, very organic, um, like I'm witnessing part of life. And that's kind of what I get from it. I know I'm kind of going down this weird rabbit hole, but the colors all work together really well. There's this density at the bottom, but as the bubbles rise, if you will, um, it feels lighter, the colors are different. And it just, for me, flows so well top to bottom um and i don't know how to better describe it other than that kind of early cellular division bringing life you know yeah i that can see that sense. yeah the color is really interesting because like i mean if we were just like straight up illustrating right but that yellowy vomit green is ugh. i mean it's such a <laughs> color right but it it is it making me uncomfortable either? Like, yeah, it feels very organic. Like I started saying like, oh, it's disgusting because it feels like like germs or like cells or like, you know, something yeah. like Nicole said, you like it's growing. It has this beautiful sense of motion to it's it. It's a petri dish. It's a petri dish. And, you know, maybe I don't want to touch it, but I sure like looking at it. And it's just so well balanced throughout. And I, I think, yeah, I mean, how... Whatever medium was used, Olga's saying in the comments, it's paint pouring with a the, torch, which makes so probably a lot of sense. pouring and then then hitting it with something, which which lends itself to that very like 
in motion momentary captured feeling like the pieces fit together because they were together maybe at one point and mm -hmm. it's beautiful it's making something beautiful out of something that maybe otherwise would elicit uncomfortable feelings so from a kind of visual literacy perspective a big part of of what is making us have those organic feelings is exactly that relation to the shape language that we're used to seeing in things like cells dividing or lichen growing or crystals growing or, you know, what we've seen in Petri dishes, like oil spills even, um, you know, can can form shapes like this. So there, there's a lot of this that references things we're already used to, which then, of course, goes, you know, pulls those evolutionary triggers in our head. But then also we have the contrast of of shapes that are happening here and the contrast of colors that's happening. And so there's a lot, there's a lot that we're already used to that makes something like this that's highly abstract also feel familiar, um, which I think is it helps it go over well, right? We don't have a whole lot of time left. So I want to look at a couple of images um, because of how much there is to see in them. And of course, if you are a photographer and you're not familiar with this shot, I highly encourage you to go look up Henri, Henri Cartier-Bresson and look through his work. Um, he was a photographer, the grandfather, kind of godfather of street photography, um, who paid attention to what he called the decisive moment. And that is the hallmark of his work. So when we're looking at this image, what do we see? Separately, side tangent, I was thinking of Cartier-Bresson when Bassam in the beginning was talking about wanting, feeling like he was trapped into that same perspective in photography, mm. right? And there's this kind of iconic, you know, photo school quote from Cartier-Bresson that the camera is an extension of the eye. And, you know, finding those decisive moments, it, it's entirely dependent on your own personal perspective as photographer. So you don't if, if you like one certain thing, if you like a certain way of seeing, if you like a certain set of gear, like that is how you see and that's what makes your art yours. And I love that. Angles and lines and shapes and light. Oh, this satisfies every part of me. This is so good. Yes. Yeah, there's, there's, so there's so much. There's so much in. This, there's so much in this image. I mean, you can spend a lot of time looking at every detail, and there's you always find something new in there, something different. These stairs are way better than the other stairs. Way better. <laughs> My favorite thing about this image is is everything, <laughs> but also um, I think the depth of it is something that I, I really, really enjoy. And <clears throat> the depth in so many ways, um, the depth in um, of field, the depth of vision, the depth of shape, of like everything that plays into this um, is my thing. Lights, lines, angles, textures, got everything except color, which I'm okay with, yeah. Well, and, and so this was also taken on, um, great, now the name of the Greek, it's a Greek island, it just went out of my head. Um, but obviously, as you can see, the, the plaster buildings. So this would have been <clears throat> very desaturated in general anyway, um, aside from the colors of the doors and her, you know, her dress. So the decision, um, I don't know if it's Santorini, Olga, uh, I would have to look it up. I, I don't know. If it's Mike and I don't know. Um, I have to, I would have to go back and, and do a search. Um, but so one of the things that we talked about, obviously a lot over the past uh, couple of weeks and then yesterday, not yesterday, but set, um, Friday, really specifically, we talked about contrast and things like lines, right? We talked about leading lines, which we have wine, 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 wine. We have those everywhere. We talked about framing, which is all of this here and all of this here. We talked about contrast, which is obviously all over the image. We talked about the contrast of movement and everything is still and she is the only thing that is moving and how our eye is going to directly go there. If we also look at the way that her shapes echo 
the shape of everything that is around her. Um, it's just such a brilliant and look where she's at. She's just dead center in the frame, but she doesn't feel bullseyed because of like the weight of everything else that's in the image. And like, this is one of those moments where somebody with a trained eye has just masterfully captured almost all the pieces. <laughs> the only thing that we're missing here is just a little more contrast in shape language, but I think that happens here. I think her head is the only circle, circular shape in the image. Everything else is angular. It's also, it's also interesting that the, uh, the, the, the hottest part, the brightest part is actually leading to her face because you, know, you would kind of lose her if it was that white part above her uh, was more, was lighter. You notice that your eye goes straight to that white wall above her head and the one above it, which, which brings you to her immediately. So you're seeing here, huh? Yeah, yeah, right there. Other, you know, obviously working with the dark, you know, going up the stairs, but because, you know, your eye goes to the brightest, brightest area, that kind of reinforces that center of the image. It's, it's, it, took, it, it didn't take mm. me a while to find her, but it's not the first thing I looked at. Right. Interesting. And yeah, I mean, and she is right at the end of this line of, of heat of contrast as well. Um, Olga saying that the stones are also round and it's really interesting because you're correct. Like there, there's much more roundness in the shape of the stones. Um, but when you start bringing a stone from, from like this shape, and you look at it in perspective to this shape, it loses a lot of that roundness and becomes more angular purely because of perspective. But I think I think it's interesting, and you're right, that we have come some of these shapes that are kind of also leading up in that direction. I totally just don't say it. I know what I drew. It was an accident. <clears throat> <laughs> Yeah. I love the doors. Just since we've talked so much They're about so... weight. Yeah. Did you have that? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yes, I did. Um, yeah, I think that's great, Becca, because we have like, so this door here, right, is roughly if you were to combine those doors, they would just about match the size of this guy over here. Whoops. Um, so like that, that framing using those doors is brilliant as well. Especially, I mean, they're at different depths. I mean, the, the, the... in space, there are different planes in space, yeah. right? And they still manage to line up so mm -hmm. well. One step to the left, one step to the right, one step forward, they would not line up like that. Yeah. It keeps reminding me of that Escher photo or the Escher illustration. Yeah. Right? They're going up all the stairs the different ways. It's exactly what popped into my head when I first saw this. But then I realized, oh, this is real. Um, yeah. So good. Perfect. So good. This is the last one we're going to look at. I had to grab both of these because they're two of my all time favorites. Um, so now, if you know to recognize his style. <laughs> Here is Cartier Bresson again. Um, and another one of those, another one of those perfect decisive moments <laughs> using all of the same tools that we saw in the last one and adding then these echoing lines of curves, which are just so good. Well, obviously his camera sucked so because what do we the, see here? <laughs> he's out of focus, right? So he's not using an R5, right? So clearly he doesn't take his craft seriously. Mm -hmm. um, obviously. The railing. Shutter speed was way too long. Ugh. So uh, never make Sports Illustrated. So the railing coming down and curving <laughs> in um, absolutely blows me away. Like just the railings are, I can't get over it. I just can't get over it. and how that curves into the curb. I'm just it's masterful. Mm -hmm. Oh, 
one of my a- favorite Facebook moments in like the history of being on Facebook was some photography group. Someone, yes. it was digital photography group. Did you see this thread? Oh my God. Someone shared this photo and it was just like a yes, bunch of yes. people roasting it, like not knowing who it was or why it was good and didn't use, you know, fast enough shutter speed, you know, aperture shit. Like, you know, they should have like, whatever. Oh my God. <sighs> Anyway, I love that. And you're sitting there so. dying, like, do you even understand? Yep. And all the old school yep. film people are just like, <laughs> I cry. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, yes. I love the contrast in the railing here, especially. Like, there's such beautiful tonal range all over, all over. And you wouldn't have that, I don't think, if this were a color image. It would not hit the same. But then you have those few really deep, rich darks that just add to that beautiful, beautiful sense of shape and motion. Yes. Um, so Crystal saying the tonality, the movement, everything Olga saying, but for real, the composition, the texture, the contrast between the stones, the rail, the rider, like this has, it just hits all of those things that make images like this so damn pleasing. And I actually, I'm interested and I want to see really quickly if we were to do this, look, the tonality is nailed so much here. That even if you are, even if you're to do this, you still have a killer ass composition. Like you don't even need all of the additional details here for the tonality to just be killer. And like, when we look at the histogram, right? People would be like, oh, he's practically crushing the blacks. Um, If if you were to have a, a complainer, you know, but even just this, like, come on. We're right there. Here's our darkest leading right into exactly where the eye wants to be. So we've got contrast of all of the things. We've got our curves here and our curves here and our curves here and then punctuated by all of these like straight lines and all of these angular lines and then again, kind of a similar thing to what we've seen before, where the main kind of round shapes are here where the center of the image is at, that, that focal point of the image. And so we have all of these angular lines contrasted with these round shapes. We have movement, like we discussed before, and how movement draws the eye. We have the darkest parts of the image all pointing in the right direction. Um, all of the framing that's happening, like all of this stuff is still super interesting but it all serves as a as a a backdrop in a way to what we're really looking at so like there everything about everything about it is just a brilliantly composed shape and tonality used as well as it can be used i'm, I'm like imagining, imagining oh no go ahead i'm just i'm just like imagining like i don't know Gen Z on TikTok trying to recreate this and doing like 50 takes to get the bike in the right spot and I want to cry. <laughs> I'm old now. Learn film, kids. Oh, so good. So good for so many reasons. If the bike were sharp and still, it would not have the same impact. Still good, but different. Mm. Love it. Love it. Love it. Um, All right, so we have looked at several images today. Um, I wanted, I had planned on grabbing a couple. I actually grabbed this from the Mid Journey server um, because I wanted a chance for us to see the way that even AI art, and though it's guided by humans, it's using human examples and human input in order to draw from. And it's doing a lot of the same things that we do because it's mimicking our visual understanding of the world, right? And so we have a lot of those same things that we've already talked about here, even in an image like this with the contrasting shapes and the colors, we've got the blues and the yellows kind of framed by these desaturated 
um, blues and purples and you have a lot of red balancing some of the reds that are happening down here where the blue is leading our eye into the frame. This is, this is not made by a human, although it's human directed. Um, and yet we still have, tell me you wouldn't like to walk down the street. Tell me that you don't look at this and get a sense of the fantastical. Um, that you could see this being in um, an animated film or as art for a book or a movie. Like, even though this is made by a computer, it's pulling from our understanding of visual literacy. And we're bringing our understanding of visual literacy to the to then interpret the things that we're seeing. So it's just really, really cool at least for me to think about, is this perfect? No. There are a lot of things that an actual artist would need to go in here and fix. There's so, perspective issues, there's technical issues with like what's happening, but does that stop me from enjoying it? <laughs> are we all familiar with uh, Plato's theory of forms? I am, it's my favorite thing ever. All right, so this, theory this of, is like- Theory of what, I'm sorry? Theory of forms. Oh. So I feel like AI art is like the ultimate, like most meta example of mimesis, like in, in Platonism, like you have your, your ethereal, perfect, whatever it is, right? And everything that exists in reality is just an imitation, a mimicry of this perfection in the whatever other sphere of existence. And art, according to Plato, art is terrible because it's just mimicry of mimicry of perfection. And then we have AI art, which is just mimicking the artistic mimicry of reality, which is mimicry of perfection. It's like this trickle down form effect. Um, but that's exactly what's happening. It's mimicking us. It doesn't have a brain. It's not making autonomous decisions. It is mimicking what we say we like. Yep. I highly encourage folks, if, if you don't know anything about Plato's theories of forms, um, to go read up on that. We actually, I don't know if you guys remember this or Becca, I'm not sure if you were with us then. We had this discussion one day because I was talking about Plato's theory of forms and um, we, we were talking about that and then also um, about um, quantum mechanics. Uh, and it was all just one big jumbled conversation, in part because to me, Plato's theory of forms is the way that I feel about reality. So this idea that somewhere, table or building or paper lantern, there is the perfect ideal of that thing. And everything we see that we recognize as paper lantern or table or whatever is just a shadow of the perfect realism, the idea of it, where it exists somewhere in our collective consciousness. Um you want to get real really, weird really with fun it. conversation. <laughs> you get so weird with it. I mean, we can get real weird with it because there's like a Platonism in mathematics to the idea that, you know, the perfect numbers and stuff like that uh, and perfect equations, they all exist out there on this other, you know, form of perfection. Uh, it's, I don't know. I'm just convinced it's a multidimensional thing. That's all. <laughs> like it, it's, it exists on another level of reality and we're pulling from it with our, our consciousness, which could be a quantum field like consciousness could be a quantum field that we have access to based on complexity we don't know that could be and if it is then we might be pulling from the rest of reality maybe plato was way way closer just saying okay uh -huh. nerds. <laughs> yes <Becca>. nerds <laughs> i don't mind it um so yes, just using this as an example that even for something like AI art, visual literacy still exists. The rules that, and, and remember, they're not rules, they're an explanation of why things work in our brain. That's what visual literacy is. So when we talk about this, when we talk about visual literacy, we're not talking about the rules. This is so beautiful. Again, Basam, I love this so freaking much. Um, and I know we can't. Oh, thank you. We can't do it. But like, this is one of my favorites. Um we can't stay today because we've already passed over our time, yes. but um, we will look at it another time. Anyway, yeah, but just, we a, talk just about... an interesting fact about that picture, Nicole, just for you to know. Yeah. I took it uh, standing on Mont Blanc in France uh, across across one of the mountains across from Mont Blanc and uh, from the peak. 
And I took it with a $100 point and shoot 8 megapixel camera or something like that back in 2010. Yeah. Yeah. Rock and roll, man. I love it. Um, yeah. So when we're talking about visual literacy, a lot of people have stumbled a little bit over the idea that what we're talking about are rules that are applied to you and how you can make art. And it's not. It's not rules that are applied in the same way that gravity is not being applied to you. It's a thing that exists. And when we talk about visual literacy, we're talking about how we do things. So we're saying your brain reacts to imagery, your brain reacts to visuals this way. And if we know that, then you can make decisions in order to manipulate those things. We know that gravity behaves a certain way. And so if we can take advantage of gravity to do things like make elevators, right? Um, or we can try to say that gravity is a rule, but it's just a natural phenomenon. The way that your brain interprets imagery is a natural phenomenon. If you understand how it does that, then you can make better decisions about your art to communicate the way you want to, to help people feel the way you want to, all of that stuff. So at the end of the day, visual literacy is really just a way for us to get a deeper understanding of how we connect and understand the things we see and the way that you can go about then manipulating those things in order to get across what you want to do with your art. So this is a con conversation we can continue to have in the group this week. Um, we can show some examples and talk about stuff and just break down the things that we see and why they work for us and, uh, and just have those conversations. But wherever you fall on the spectrum of where you're at in your understanding or how much you agree or disagree with the whole thing, I would deeply encourage you. There are a lot of videos you can go back and watch in the Facebook group and on the YouTube channel to, to get in some of this visual literacy stuff that we've been talking about but this can only make you a better artist. There isn't a reality that we live in right now where knowing more about visual literacy is gonna make you worse, right? And at the very least, it's gonna make your understanding, your experience with art deeper and more nuanced and, and just give you a, like a greater appreciation for the things that you see and the artists who create them and the depths of their understanding about what makes for compelling visuals and good visual communication. So now that we are at the end of everything, I just wonder, does anybody have anything they want to end with or anything you want to leave folks with before we shut down for today? That includes audience friends. I've ordered two books off of Amazon from Cardia Brasson. Um, just to add to the coffee table. No, I think I think I said a lot at the beginning of this in terms of the way that it's made me look at my own photography and not only my art, but other people's art as well. So before I get quick to judge, I like this, I don't like it. It gives me pause and I start to look at it and understand why don't I like it? Why do I like it? And now I start going through the checklist of, is it color? Is it composition? Is it expression? Is it texture? Like all the things. And again, it's just, these are skills that are nice to have, not rules, but it's great to be able to read at a college level rather than, you know, a Dr. Seuss level. And I feel it's kind of what I'm getting to. I'm able to read these images much more quickly with much more comprehension than I was even a year ago. And um, so even talking about this as much as we have has given me a lot of new, new stuff to work with. So I like that a lot. I saw that. Go, Becca. I'm just going to sit here and keep keeping being quiet. While, uh, while she's thinking, I, I've got to get going. So um, uh, great session. Uh, don't really have much to say uh, to end it. Uh, have a great week and we'll see you soon. Okay. Bye. Fine, I can talk. Um, yeah. Yeah, I just still with the kind of like humanistic quality of it, right? Like that, that is always going to be where the interest falls is how do we better communicate? Not just like, how do we make better art? But, you know, that's, of course, of interest anyway. But how do we better communicate if that's what we're trying to do? Whether that's 
with our friends or our clients or just the anonymous audience that exists out in the ether when we throw things up there for attention. Um, you know, what are what language are we speaking and how do we speak it more fluently? Really important question to ask because whether you intend to or not, you're communicating and somebody's going to be interpreting it. And if you don't control as much of you as much as you can of the interpretation, you are deciding to allow people to bring their own interpretation to the image. And while that's a very strong way to go and you can decide to leave things abstract enough that people can interpret it, um, Sometimes they will interpret it in ways that you did not intend or expect. And that's something that we all have to deal with as artists. And the fact that if somebody interprets something in a way that causes harm or in a way that causes negative feedback on you and your intentions, that's something you need to be aware of. And you need to be prepared. If you want to leave things up to the viewer, you are going to have people come to you believing that you have done something based on their interpretation of what you've done. And so that, and that is a legitimate artistic choice. So I'm, I'm not trying to say that it's not, you just need to be prepared for that to happen so that you're not caught off guard. Um, and otherwise, you know, making those artistic choices, using what you know of visual literacy in order to communicate better is, is just letting you speak, like Becca was saying, it's a language and it lets you speak it with more fluency. And so that is a choice that you have to make as well. And remember, we're not speaking with everything all at the same time. In a conversation with you, I don't have to use metaphor. I don't have to use simile. I don't have to try to include subtext. All of those are things I can include and things that could potentially help me communicate more clearly, but I don't have to use them. And the same thing is true in your art. You don't have to use every aspect of visual literacy all the time. You can choose to use color and contrast and not shape contrast, and that's still a legitimate choice. You have all of these tools on the table that you can use. Choose the ones that make the most sense for you, the ones that you feel drawn to, and the ones that seem to make the most sense for the art you're creating, and you're going to be going a long way towards making art that is compelling and that speaks and that people can connect with. So hopefully over the past months um, on this journey with us, you have, you just feel like you've learned more about visual literacy and, and your ability to use it um, and understand it has been increased. This is essentially kind of the end of our visual literacy journey for this go round. And we are going to start being together here Monday afternoons at 1 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. That is 12 p.m. for the West Coast and 3 p.m. for the East Coast. So join us then. Come hang out with us. Um, let us know what you think of all the things. And if you're not in the Facebook group, if you're watching this in YouTube today, or if you are listening to this in the podcast later on, come and hang out in Facebook land. That's where we're all at, uh, where we're learning together and making art and sharing with each other. So you do have to answer some questions. So make sure that you do that because it's a private group for the safety of our members. But do that. Come hang out with us until next Monday at 1 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. Go make amazing stuff. Use all your skills and we will see everybody then. Thanks for being here, friends. Bye.